Good morning and welcome to our 10th year of celebrating Martin Luther King Day of Service. This is part of a national initiative and we are happy to be continuing the tradition that Linda Katz, a former Youth Commission member, introduced to us 10 years ago this year. Um, the Hopkinton Youth Commission is presenting this as a way of getting our community to work together and to involve youth in um, things that are going to serve them for the rest of their lives. Martin Luther King Jr. stood up against the bullies of his time and changed the laws which kept people apart. He stood for love, peace, and doing the right thing in the face of great oppression and opposition. We often hear the I Have a Dream speech that he made on the watch marching excuse me, March on Washington in 1963. But today I want to quote from a different speech Dr. King gave at the Montgomery, Alabama, Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in November of 1957. It is relevant today as well. So this morning, as I look into the eyes of all my brothers in Alabama and all over America and all over the world, I say to you, I love you. I would rather die than hate you. I am foolish enough to believe that through the power of this love, somewhere, men of the most recalcitrant bent will be transformed. We have the power to love our enemies, to bless those persons that cursed us, to even decide to be good to those persons who hated us, and we even prayed for those persons who despitefully used us. That quote to me epitomizes Martin Luther King's bravery in the face of conflict. He knew that he was doing a risky thing, but to him, love was so important and loving our neighbor as ourself that he risked his life. I'd like to share a song with you called The Magic Penny about love and what sharing it can do for you as well as for others. Please sing with me the second time through. I hope you have the words or can share. This is by Malvina Reynolds. My dad um, is a singer and he sang it to me. His birthday is actually two weeks before MLK's birthday. So they are both, or Martin Luther King would have been 87 this year. Okay, it goes like this. Love is something if you give it away, give it away, give it away. Love is something if you give it away, you end up having more. Oh, it's just like a magic penny. Hold it close and you won't have any. Lend it, spend it, and you'll have so many. They'll roll all over the floor. Love is something if you give it away, Give it away, give it away. Love is something if you give it away, you end up having more. Please sing with me this time, I'm not a good soloist. Okay, here we go. Love is something if you give it away, give it away, give it away. Love is something if you give it away, you end up having more. Oh, it's just like Martin Luther King being so much about love is because it relates to our speaker, Dr. Arthur Sierra McCauley, who has worked with many people over the years in his counseling practice and has written several books. We are very fortunate today that he will share his wisdom and thoughts on empathy, service, and giving back. Very important as we give service on this MLK. Dr. Sierra McCauley. Thank you for that beautiful introduction, Margie. Um, 
Martin Luther King, Dr. Martin Luther King, died 48 years ago, 48 years ago. And I'm going to compare for you a bit of what was happening at that time to what's happening today in our society. 48 years ago, Dr. King made the comment that Americans are too concerned with the idea of their salaries and the size of their automobiles instead of their contribu contributions to mankind. He said that we lacked empathy, that we weren't trusting enough of each other. He said that we were too stressed in our society. And most importantly, he said that we were exuding much prejudice in our society, which he hoped would end soon. Today, 48 years later, where are we? The stress in our society is very significant. 70% of teenagers say that they suffer from stress on a daily basis. That was a study just released by Yale University and the Lady Gaga Foundation last week. 50% of adults say they wake up in the middle of the night due to stress. 75% of American workers say that they experience stress either emotionally or physically on a daily basis. Trust in America has decreased. 20 years ago, Americans said that they had five to seven close friends. Today we say we have two to three close friends. So conditions have worsened, race relations are difficult, and prejudice is at a high. What happens when we're prejudiced? If you're sitting next to someone in your classroom, or you're working next to someone, and you think because they're Irish, Italian, Jewish, Iranian, whatever it is, if you have some idea that there's something about them that is, is, is causing you anxiety, that's causing you to feel insecure, you have a distortion, and that distortion causes anxiety and stress. What happens when we have stress? We release the hormone cortisol. And we're gonna talk about two hormones today that I hope you remember. One is cortisol, and the other is oxytocin. Cortisol is a stress hormone, okay? It's released when we feel anxious and stressed, and certainly prejudice causes anxiety and stress. You cannot be standing next to someone on a bus or an airplane and feel that there's something about them that you're threatened by without feeling stress. What happens when we have cortisol in our system? It causes weight gain. It causes the deterioration of muscle mass. In other words, if you're trying to build your body and tone your body and you're an athlete, you're gonna reduce your muscle mass. It's gonna deteriorate if you have too much cortisol in your system. It causes hair loss. It causes inflammation, it causes negative thinking, and most importantly, it causes a decrease in the ability to be empathic. We have an empathic range when we're calm that is this, it's, it's like this. When you feel anxious and stressed, and you have cortisol in your system, your range shrinks to a very narrow point, and then you have narrow thinking, you have negative thinking. Cortisol produces depression, and it also produces anxiety. There's an amazing study that was done over the last few years to 10 to 14 year olds who were consistently in stressful environments in their homes. They literally, telomeres are the end of chromosomes in our bodies. And when as we age, telomeres shrink. So you can tell generally how old someone is or how they're aging by the shrinkage of these telomeres. In these 10 to 14 year old children, they had aged six years beyond their time six years beyond their time. So if they were 15 on the outside, they were 21 on the inside. That's how much, that's how the negative impact of stress can do. Now I know some of you may be saying, that's not a bad idea if I'm 15, I like to be 21 and get my license and go to college and so forth, but trust me, you don't want to age early because it deteriorates your abilities in many, in many aspects of life. So what can we do about this prejudice and stress relation. When we're, when, we're, when we're stressed in that way, we're going to produce this byproduct. And one of the greatest achievements our minds can accomplish is the ability to perceive accurately other people and ourselves. What's the capacity that can allow us to do that? Empathy. Empathy gives us the capacity to read other people accurately and to come to know ourselves accurately. Empathy is the experience, the ability to experience the unique experiences of another person. Okay, it's the capacity to experience the uniqueness of another person. It's not an emotion or a feeling, it's a capacity. It's part of our genetic endowment. We're born with it, but it's like a muscle. If we don't use it, we don't develop it. 
it allows us to be more compassionate and, al and altruistic to the people around us. And it's often confused with sympathy. Sympathy is a rushing in and an identifying with someone. Empathy takes its time to discern the facts about a situation. I'll give you an example. It would be if a classmate came up to you and said, oh my God, my, uh, or said, my father's moving to Michigan. And you said, oh my God, you must be devastated. You must be heartbroken. Because in your experience, your father, you, you come from a divorced family and your father moved to California, so you, you assume because her father's moving, she's gonna be devastated. Then you find out two days later from a friend that her father left the family when she was two years old. And he's hardly had any contact with her at all. So she's not heartbroken, she's not missing him. And in fact, she was raised by a stepfather most of her life and she loved very much. So sympathy rushes in to console Empathy takes its time to understand. Empathy also releases the hormone oxytocin. Why is that important? Because oxytocin is the connecting hormone. People have called it the love hormone. It makes us feel secure. It makes us feel happy. It calms us. In empathic interactions, we experience oxytocin. So when women are pregnant, this is what happens with the baby and a mother. They experience a flood of oxytocin. It reduces anxiety, it makes us calmer, and again, it makes us happier and more able to perceive in a more expanded way. So oxytocin increases our ability to connect and be healthy. Cortisol, if released in abundance, decreases that ability. Let me tell you a few stories that will exemplify empathy, the, the positive expression of empathy, and I'll tell you a few stories that will indicate the negative expression of empathy to give you an idea. And I apologize to any guidance counselors in the audience because this, is not, this story is not reflective of guidance counselors, it's reflective of my experience when I was in high school, which was many moons ago. In those days, you could become a guidance counselor if you taught for 15 or 20 years and then they just made you a guidance counselor if you wanted to do that. So, you didn't receive the training that you received today. You know, guidance counselors have to get a master's degree, they do internships, and they have to take a lot of coursework and pass exams. In my day, that was not the, the My guidance counselor was an old English teacher who was not particularly fond of athletes. So when I was in high school, they used to publish when we were seniors in the spring, they would put 10 pictures of senior students in the paper every night. And it would tell you, they would tell you what you're going to do. You're going to go to Boston College, you're going to go in the Army, you're going to go to Framingham State, and so forth. So I had received uh, several scholarships to some lesser known academic colleges. I was not particularly a good student. Uh, I actually skipped school now and then. Um, and my, my former English teacher was not particularly impressed with my academics, so he called me down to the guidance office. <coughs> And he said, we're not gonna put your picture in the paper saying you're going to that university in Colorado. And I said, why? And he said, you're not college material. You're not the type of person that should go to college. Um, and you're gonna only embarrass your family, your community, and your school if you do that. So I wanna give you these five brochures, Army, Navy, Coast Guard, Navy, and Air Force. And I want you to pick one, go home and discuss it with your family and come in tomorrow and let me know which one you're gonna choose and I'll set you up with a recruiter and then we'll put that in the paper. So my, my mother and father owned a little furniture store and um, my father incidentally was a very intense man and I, he was in, in the OSS which was the forerunner to the CIA so he was a very direct person. So I went in and I told my father, I said, you know, I, I'm not gonna to go to college. And he said, why? And I said, well, Mr. Martin told me basically that I'm not smart enough to do that and that I'm just an athlete and I don't have good grades and it's gonna embarrass you and so forth and so on. And my father said, he said that to you? And I said, yes, he did. So we're gonna go in and talk to him tomorrow. I said, no, 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 I don't want you to do that. I don't want you to do that. He's right, he's the guidance counselor. Well, there was no keeping my father from going in with me the next day. So we went in the next day. My father wore his special suit which he wore to funerals and weddings, and his soft hat. And we sat down, and in this office, in those days, if you had a bachelor's degree, you know, had the big, big degrees, and they put them on the wall, and they had two of these degrees. They had his bachelor's degree and his master's degree. 
So Mr. Martin went on to talk about me and how I wasn't a good student and I skipped school and I wasn't academically prepared and I would do much better in the service. And my father just sat there and he kept nodding and nodding and asking more questions. And I couldn't understand what he was doing because I thought my father was going to get angry and defensive and say, you can't say that about my son. So after about 45 minutes of this, my father stood up and he shook Mr. Martin's hand and he said, Mr. Martin, I've never talked to a college man, but I'm glad that you educated me today. And Mr. Martin said to my father, I'm glad you agree with me. And my father looked at him and he said, oh, no, 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 I don't agree with you. But you determined what decision we should make. Because when I heard the way you think after 45 minutes, and I looked at you and you've got two of those big degrees on your wall, I realized my son can go to college. <laughs> Another example, and let me just highlight, why was that an example of empathy? Because empathy is expressed when you slow down. You have to slow down. You're not a quick reactor, you're a slow reactor. You discern the facts, okay? The second way to express empathy is to ask open-ended questions. Open-ended questions are clearly looking for information, for facts. Closed-ended questions slam the door shut. And actually, most questions are statements. It's like if you're dating a boy and you come home at night and, you're, and your mother says, do you really think he's cute? Well, what she really means is, I don't think he's cute. Okay, that's a closed-ended question. My father was asking open-ended questions because the truth was, he really didn't know. He didn't know and he had no exposure to people who had gone to college. So he truly wanted to listen to how a college person thinks. And he realized that it was not overly impressive. Another example that has always stayed with me powerfully has been the Columbine experience. You know the Newtown experience when the children were massacred and how tragic that is. We heard our president speak about it last week. Ooh. I always remember the Columbine experience because of one thing, because of Reverend Joel Miller, after the killings, he was the minister in the town and he was mauled by journalists when he came out of his house that morning. And they said, Dylan Kleibold's mother is at the hairdresser. What do you think? Now, Dylan Kleibold was one of the killers, if you don't remember. And Reverend Joe Miller said, I have no idea. I do not know how we can make any judgments of these people without knowing more. I have nothing to say other than I don't know. I don't know is one of the classic comments of empathy because I don't know means I am not going to jump to assumptions because I don't have facts. I'm only going to make judgments when I have facts, not because I'm being pressured into making a response. So empathy leads often to doing good and feeling good in what I sometimes call goodness breakthroughs. You know, when, when we're downhearted, when we go through difficult times, when you're rejected by a boyfriend or a girlfriend, or you don't make the basketball team, or you want to get a lead role in a play and you don't make it, or your father or mother loses their job or they're going through a divorce, during those times when our hearts are broken, our goodness sinks. We're all born with goodness. In fact, there, there are psychologists in Canada who, one in particular who has spent his life studying identical twins, and he absolutely believes that we have a goodness gene because he has seen the consistency among identical twins and their tendency to express goodness and giving. But when we're suffering and when we're downtrodden or something goes wrong in our life, we become particularly self-absorbed and we lose our goodness. It kind of goes underground. I want to tell you a story about a teacher that came to me for consultation in my practice. And um, she's a sixth grade teacher. And I, and I asked her how come she had come. And she told me, I want to tell you a story about one of my students and we'll tell you why I'm sitting here. She told me that her mother had died recently of terminal cancer and she went through a horrible experience. Radiation, chemotherapy, she lost her hair, all of the things you hear about. And my client, this teacher who came in, said that she was absolutely devastated by the experience and she just couldn't give again to her students. She was teaching, but she was sort of going through the motions. She was known for being very warm and compassionate, but she felt like she lost it. She lost her goodness. And she became very cynical. And in came into her class a little sixth grade Haitian girl. This girl had lost her parents in the earthquake in Haiti. They died. 
she came to live in California with an uncle and an aunt. The aunt became ill with pulmonary disease and the couple felt that they could no longer take care of their little niece. And she came to live with an uncle here, her mother's brother in Massachusetts. So in comes this little girl and my client had read about her. She said, I read about her because they told me something about her. She had last not only lost her parents, she had lost her country and now she's been transferred from California to Massachusetts. Luckily, she had been taught to speak English. What my client noticed, the teacher, was that this little girl was incredibly giving. And she was asked if she could tell a little, about, a little bit about her experience. She talked about her parents, she cried, she was very open, she was vulnerable, and she was very kind to her fellow classmates. And she told them at the end of her little talk that she couldn't believe she had the opportunity to be in America. And my client, the teacher, melted. What happened? It uncovered her goodness, and what I call a goodness breakthrough. This happens when we're down, but we're exposed to someone who shows us the light again. And many times in life, we think when we're down, we have to find out what's wrong with us. We don't really often have to find out what's wrong with us. We have to uncover what's right with us. So what happened was, through this experience, because this girl was able to cry and talk and be vulnerable, what psychologists call good grief, in other words, instead of avoiding it, instead of you know, overeating or not talking or pouting or becoming depressed, she was open to the world. And because of that, she created a goodness breakthrough for her teacher. She was the teacher and the teacher became the student. So, just to highlight what that goodness formula is, it's being open enough when you have difficult times to not internalize, to not go within yourself, but to order to be giving again, you have to come out of yourself. And you have to let that grief and sorrow be shared with other people. And many times, people make assumptions when they're hurt that way. Like she could have said, uh, you know, she could have been angry with God, right, because of the earthquake. She could have been angry with her uh, aunt who became ill, but she wasn't that way. She understood the facts because she was taught somewhere early in her life to have empathy. And the degree to which we can befriend other people like this little girl depends on how we talk to ourselves. If you have an understanding self voice, you know, if you're not very critical of yourself, you're much more able to give to the world. But if you criticize yourself, if you're very demanding of yourself, it makes you go more inward and it's hard to come out again, to give again. A few facts about goodness. There's a concept called helper's high. Maybe some of you have heard about it. It's, it's what happens when you give to other people unselfishly. When your concerns for someone else is above your concern for yourself, in that moment you know that they have more pain than you do and you want to give to them. It's called helper's high. What happens when you have helper's high? You, re you release endorphins, the same thing as runner's high. But what else do you release? Oxytoxin, the bonding, loving hormone, the hormone that makes us calm, makes us healthy. People who have helper's high, who experience helper's high, studies have proven, are 10 times healthier, 10 times healthier than the normal population. It's interesting that recently there have been a number of studies of wealthy people and what happens to people as, as they climb up the economic ladder. You see Berkeley has done, the University of California in Berkeley has done several studies that show as people become richer, they become greedier, their empathy goes down, they're more likely to cheat. And that was surprising because, and their health is deteriorating. Because why? Because when you're like that, when you think you have to stick to your own group, and they found that these people, a large percent of them, only associated with people that were in the upper echelon. In fact, one of the studies was done in Congress. They found that most congressmen don't even go to dinner with anyone who makes less than a half a million dollars. So how are they in touch with the rest of us? Well, how do they even know what we're experiencing? That was the, that was the bottom line, 500,000, then 2 million, 4 million, 6 million. Goodness studies have shown that the kindness, most empathic people have the greatest health. A fascinating study by psychologist Paul Wink at Wellesley College. 
He followed teenagers for 50 years, 50 years, still doing it. The study is still going on. What did he find? They did assessments to find out which teenagers were the most giving. The teenagers that were the most giving, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, and 50 years later, had the highest level of health and the highest level of success personally and professionally. Following these kids for 50 years, and the results year after year after year, decade after decade after decade are the same. They are the healthiest and most successful. So my hope for you today is that you'll decide, if you haven't already, to live a life and incorporate giving and empathy. Why? Because if you incorporate giving and empathy, you are going to oppose this evil force in our world about prejudice and hatred, okay? You will be the change. You are a change agent when you do that. But in order to do that, you cannot be quiet. You cannot sit and be passive in the face of prejudice and hatred. I am not encouraging you to be aggressive, and I am not encouraging you to be passive. I am encouraging you to speak assertively. When you're with someone who makes a prejudicial comment, say something. It's not enough to have empathy within. You have to express it. You have to put it in action. Speak. Ask that person if they make a comment about an African-American, an Iranian, an Irish person, an Italian person, whatever, somebody from Dover, somebody, somebody who has mental challenges. Ask them what the facts are. Don't get into an argument, but ask them, where did you ascertain your facts? Remember, empathy is fact-oriented. Where are your facts? Be the one who stands up and does that. Martin Luther King is honored today, 48 years later. 48 years later. Why? Was he a star athlete? Did he play in the NFL, the NBA? Was he a multimillionaire? Did he win an Oscar because he was an actor in a movie? No. No, no. 48 years later, you're sitting here because he spoke up against hatred and prejudice. And you can do the same thing. You have the ability within you. We're all born with goodness and empathy. It's inside you. Uncover it. You can be a Dr. Martin Luther King, but you have to make that choice. I hope you will, because if you do, you'll be happier, you'll be respected by your peers, and you'll be one of those change agents that's going to make a better world. Thank you.